and energy efficient roof lights and glass roofs. Uh, my name is Rosemary and I'm the Academic and Regional Services Coordinator for K. Um, we're always on the lookout for relevant CPDs for our members. If any of any subjects that you might uh, want us to um, investigate or if you've got a provider that you know of, then please let me know. If you're watching us live, um, you can obviously put questions in. If I could ask people to leave their questions until you can put them in the question and answer section, we'll ask them at the end. But I could ask people to refrain from questions until the end because then obviously it's a fair of a barrier to get through. Um, so I'm going to introduce today's CPD presenter, Barry Marchant, who's a technical sales manager for Lamilux. Barry has over seven years' experience in the glazing industry and he loves meeting and engaging with people to put his knowledge to use and has recently passed the exam to become a certified passive house tradesperson, supporting his passion in promoting and championing passive house movement. Now, if I just, uh, let me just minimise that down. You can obviously in the, um, I'm going to stop sharing now and then I will pass back over to Gary yeah, Barrett. Thank you, Dave. Over to you. Okay, let's get this, let's get this rolling. Okay, thank you very much for that very pleasant introduction. I don't get as nice as one as that from my own colleagues, so what can I say? Right, so I'm just going to skip through. We've got a couple of, uh, a lot. we do an awful lot of online CPDs and we do our own sort of foyers. And in that process, we allow people to join and have a few, a little bit of music and some slides to roll through to allow people to join. But not appropriate for today. Apologise. Welcome to the Lamilux CPD, specifying sustainable and energy efficient roof lights and glass roofs. Before, just a very little bit about myself. Um, as I say, I've worked in various glazing companies, specifying windows, sliding doors, bifolding doors and roof lights. Uh, for the last six years, I've been working in horizontal glazing specification, uh, working directly with the architectural community from initial design concepts through detailed drawing approval, the tender process and then site measure, basically from beginning to end. I really enjoy getting involved in projects and, and helping to ensure the right solutions are utilised and, and integrate with the rest of the building. I probably get way too invested, if I'm honest, because I do like things being done right. Um, I am and would be your direct point of contact should you wish to discuss any kind of technical details or conduct a design meeting or, or even obtain costings. And I do look forward to trying to develop a relationship between Lamelux and yourselves. So just a little bit uh, about uh, Lamilux. Uh, Lamilux has been trading for over 100 years. Um, Lamilux is actually one of Europe's most established and experienced manufacturers of high performance roof glazing systems. Uh, it's employing 1300 people. Um, uh, they take over an entire town called Rehau in Bavaria and they have a turnover of about 300 million each year. Now sustainability is a key focus in product development and product production methods in terms of product life cycles and product value. All Lamilux products are tested to the highest standards with EPD certificates available. Now I'm going to give you a very brief, brief overview of products. I'm not going to go on about that for too long, um, but just to give you a brief overview of the bits and pieces that we do and we'll cover these really more over in terms of topics rather than products. Um, at Lamilux, um, we are very much about providing daylight and ventilation solutions. Um, we will touch on roof access, smoke ventilation and passive certified solutions. Um, the content within the CPD seminar will cover areas specifically to do with specification of roof lights and glass roofs. If you would like any kind of a bespoke presentation to cover other areas, please just let us know. Um, we are planning on launching a CPD directly on Passive House shortly uh, when my colleague gets five minutes to write it. So I said, just a brief overview of some of our main products. Um, all of the following are CE marked quality according to EN 138030, uh, with CE label product declaration and benefit from factory production approved ISO 9001. Now uh, the PR60 system is a versatile uh, system suitable for shallow pitch applications. It has a thermally broken and isothermally balanced design. It achieves UW values of approximately 1.3 and uh, with class 4 air tightness, which we'll talk about later. The uh, partially prefabricated transoms and mines are 60 mil. So this is a it's quite a robust system. Um, and whilst it does have domestic application, it tends to uh, only on a sort of a, a reasonable scale. If it's too small, it just looks too bulky. 
Um, the PL60 offers some excellent design flexibility with an extensive range of options and fittings. And uh, PL60 is suitable for pitches all the way down to three degrees, unlike some of the adapted curtain wall systems that you see. Options including triple glazing, solar control, integrated natural ventilations and chev or uh, smoke heat exchange ventilation, as well as some uh, a full passive house certified motion. Um, also, we can offer non-fragile, including maintenance walk-on glazing specs where required, and we will talk about all of that a little bit later. Um, we can also supply this in 30 minute, 60 minute, and now even 90 minute fire rated versions as well. We have a full range of modular glass roof lights suitable for flat or shallow pitched applications. Um, and these include products with an angle built into the frame. Um, and I became an expert over the years at going to building sites and helping a builder calculate what a three degree pitch is over a given distance um, and drawing it all on with Sharpies and stuff. You don't need to do anything like that, so it's a lot easier. Um, all of the uh, Lamy Lux standard sizes are supplied with uh, an insulated curve with varying heights, which makes everything a lot easier. But we'll again look at that and the benefits of those sort of things later. Uh, as per the PL60, they are thermally broken and isothermally balanced, and they achieve uh, UW values very similar to the PL60 product and same air tightness to class four. You can do triple glazing, solar control again. We do opening vents, some with uh, hidden actuators, and again, passive house uh, PHPP certified versions. Uh, and my favorite circles and circular upstands, uh, which are so much easier when you don't have to actually make them. And uh, last thing, uh, our new product, uh, the Lamilux modular glass skylight, the MS78, is the newest innovation from Lamilux. And this combines all of the advantages of the FE and the PR60. Uh, so it sort of brings you a pre-glazed, single currently mono pitch roof light. Uh, the thermally broken mono pitch roof light can be configured by forming a, a row of prefabricated modules, uh, presenting some really good design flexibility. And it's, it's actually very, very easy to specify and install. Um, even managed to put some sections together at a show in about five minutes, having never seen it before. I was very surprised. The uh, MS78 achieves U values somewhere between 1 and 1.5, subject to the glazing options that someone went for. Again, uh, air tightness to class 4, EN 12207, and water type class 4 to uh, BSEN 12208. So, as I said, it's a mono pitch roof light with inclination angles of the substructure from 5 to 30 degrees currently, but we're hoping to be able to increase on that shortly and a maximum clear ceiling opening of about 20 metres. Again, triple glazing, solar control glass. Um, and a big thing that's unique about this is that you can put opening sections adjacent to each other. You, you can you can all be open. You can, there doesn't have to be either or or something like that, like some a lot of the other stuff that's in the market. So that just kind of helps add some context to some of the bits and pieces that we've talked about when I'll give you some visual bits and pieces. Um, these are the learning objectives that we would hope to cover today. Um, I won't read these to you. Um, by the end of the CPD, um, we should hope that you would have a good understanding regarding the, the eight learning objectives shown on this screen. So, to start with, we'll have a little look at daylight. Um, the definition of daylighting is lighting an indoor space with openings such as windows and skylights. Now, central atria are a common feature today in public buildings. They are used as multifunctional circulation spaces in the centre of large multi-storey buildings. A well-designed atrium can bring daylight into internal spaces, not only directly below, but also into the side spaces using the concept of borrowed light, thus helping, helping achieve some desired and required light levels. A uh, Harvard Business Review study, Daylight Work, Health, Wellbeing and Productivity in Offices, highlighted the design of an office and how it has a material impact on the health, well-being and productivity of its occupants. Now, when surveyed, 33% of workers felt their workspaces had insufficient natural light, and nearly half of workers surveyed said they had this led to fatigue and tiredness. It concluded that the design of an office has a material impact on the health, well-being and productivity of its occupants and users. And as you can see from the figures, the benefits not only include significant reductions in reported eye strain, headaches and fatigue, but also substantial increases in well-being and performance. Now, the Hersong Mahone Group published the first study on how daylighting in elementary school classrooms is associated with improved test scores. 
Now, this includes the analysis of over 9,000 students' records across three school districts. The study conclusions are powerful and, and speak for themselves, confirming marked improvements which are enhanced further when introducing open ball windows for natural ventilation. And I, I generally, actually, I say this and it sounds like a throw, I actually had a look at this and I read it. It's generally quite an interesting read and, and something worth looking into. Now, the conclu conclusions basically included 20% uh, improvement in student learning rates when students are taught in a well-lit classroom, up to 18% higher test scores in the classrooms with most daylight, 23% faster learning when larger windows are present, and that well-diffused skylights resulted in 19 to 20% improvements in learning. Also, uh, by introducing openable windows into this, that students would progress a further 7 to 8% faster. Uh, University of South of study entitled Clever Classrooms also found that the physical characteristics of schools impacted 16% on learning. The light, temperature and air quality made up a significant percentage of these characteristics and all of this relates to roof glazing. A further study from the same group, the Hersong Mahone group, looked at daylight and spending. Um, analysis looked at 108 stores where two thirds of the stores had sky lighting and a third didn't. Now the design and operation of all the store sites were remarkably uniform uh, with the exception of the presence of skylights in some. Now, all other things being equal, when the sales data was linked to the number of skylights in each store, the study found that an, an average like a non skylit store in the chain could potentially have achieved 40% higher sales with the addition of skylights when they looked at the data. Um, the presence and quantity of the skylights in the store was concluded to be a, a good predictor of the future sales performance of a store in the chain. And, and it's interesting when I look at shopping centres and those that have you know, managed to survive and those that haven't done well, one of the ones that's always seemed to do well despite you know, retail trends is the Kingston Bentall Centre, which has huge uh, natural daylighting and always has been, the food court's always very popular. It's just interesting to conclusion, personal experience. So if someone's designing for schools, um, the Education Funding Agency or EFA has developed some baseline designs as examples of how the requirements of the priority school building programmes can be delivered within budget. Optimum environmental conditions for learning include sufficient levels of balanced glare-free daylight to classrooms and natural ventilation. BRE environmental assessment method gives credit for the inclusion of these. So, Questions that you often get asked uh, when at a design stage, um, you know, how what is how much is enough light? And, and I suppose by their orientation, usually towards the sun, roof glazing can introduce four or five times more daylight and potentially deeper into a building compared with vertical windows. So how how much is enough light? Um, I, mean, I mean, it depends on the space, uh, client perception, use of the space and, and our experiences. We, we need light to help control the brightness of surfaces that are in the user's field of vision, i.e. The, like the working plane. And understanding the intended use of a space will give a, a better indication of how much light will be required to create the appropriate environment. Um, and we used to sort of look at the, you know, what sort of lux was required for sort of like school, school classrooms and offices and stuff. And it really isn't that much, but not sufficient by just normal vertical glazing. So, I mean, Flipping it to the other way, um, how much daylight is too much? Uh, to avoid glare, it's important to coordinate a lighting strategy to balance out any dark spots between roof lights. It's over brightness of daylight and the resulting sharp contrast between dark and light areas of a room that causes the most glare. Uh, general rule is to space out the roof lights by around one to one and a half times the height of the ceiling. Um, but this kind of assumes that the diffuse, there's like diffused daylight or some controllable blinds are also, you know, to manage this more efficiently. Glare can be controlled with some glass products, uh, like producing an opaque appearance. Um, there's one such product, something called Oculux, which is a light diffusing insulating glass with a capillary slab in the cavity, which allows for an even and shadow free illumination. I've done some art galleries that use products like that. So it's just nice and consistent all day long. This is a slide that often feels dread when I bring this up in architecture practices. Um, 
Roof light products are affected by various building regulations, depending on where the roof light is situated in the building and, and, and also the function that the product is performing. Um, the main building regulations that influence roof light specification are those on this slide and cover everything from fire safety in B, um, means of ventilation in F, protection from falling, collision and impact, uh, K, conservation of fuel and power, uh, affecting thermal insulation in document L, which has been re fairly recently changed and updated, and security, which is uh, approved document Q. And originally when we were writing this CPD, you know, we, we, we had, we, we, we we couldn't get this slide down under about 25 minutes of explaining through all the different regs. And I don't think anybody really needs to want to do that to them. Um, we could easily spend the rest of this presentation and longer discussing all of them. Uh, example, uh, recent part changes to L under thermal performance, etc. These include changes to U values and how they are calculated and now perform include a performance standard for site built curbs, which is causing a lot of people dramas and up explain a little bit more visually later. The simple answer really is that specification managers should be able to answer any of these questions and, and, and also advise you of any relevant regs that you may fall foul of if you don't take certain considerations into it and, and really should be carrying out due diligence on your behalf um, just to making sure that you know to ensure compliance um, and, it, and it, you'll see a general theme with this which is you know use people like me to, to check these things for you and check your designs rather than giving you long, lengthy lectures about what you have to do and don't do and what remember and not remember. Uh, the HSC or Health and Safety Executive is Britain's national regulatory for workspace, workplace health and safety. They endeavour to prevent work-related death, injury and ill health through regulatory actions supported by globally recognised scientific expertise. The HSE are extremely keen to have non-fragile assemblies specified for installation on all roofs, especially in buildings that are considered to be at risk from vandals or intruders who find their way onto the roof. Those in control of the roof works have a responsibility to devise safety methods of working, which in addition to ensuring the materials are specified correctly, should include ensuring that the use of suitable work equipment and adequate supervision. By breaching the HSE regulations, you are at risk of prohibited continued work, a prison sentence or having to pay a hefty fine. But far more importantly, having to live with the, the, you know, the consequences and the responsibility for an injury or God forbid a death. Which sounds harsh, but is meant to communicate the importance of this. Um, Non-fragility um, and in terms of safety and what glazing people should be, it causes a lot of drizzle and we thought about how we can try to cut this down into a way that can communicate compactly. So the next two slides are our attempt to try and do that. Um, and I think when, when you're thinking about specifying non-fragility in the roof light, you know, we need to ascertain which class and test it all falls under. And there are some key differences between glass and thermoplastic roof lights. Um, now, there's a publication issued by the Advisory Committee for Roof Safety, uh, test for non-fragility of large element roof assemblies, and it describes a test standard which can be applied to any product which will form part of a roof or a roof, and is intended to provide information about whether it can support the instantaneous loads imposed on it by a person stumbling and or falling onto it. Now, assemblies when tested by a competent person may be classified as non-fragile class A, class B and class C. However, there are differences between thermoplastic and glass roof lights. Um, we're going to concentrate on glass today. Uh, there's a, a fair bit more to it. Um, you can ask about thermoplastic later, um, and this is mainly used in commercial applications. And, and to be fair, you know, a lot of polycarbonate domes and barrel roof lights are not even used on commercial properties in this country as much as they are in the rest of Europe. Now, in the past, um, the ACR had not accounted for the new safety issues associated with glass. And whilst glass may pass the ACR soft body impact test, it is particularly susceptible to hard body impacts that do not form part of the ACR test. And these may cause it to shatter and may also allow shards of glass to fall onto people below. Now, this has been recognised by the glass industry for some time. And as a result, the Centre for Window and Cladding Technology, or CWCT, devise specific non-fragility tests for large area glazing. 
Now, these are based on the ACR soft body impact test, together with additional hard body impact tests, and limit the size of shards of glass falling from broken panes to minimise the risk to any personal beneath. Now, glass roof lights are covered by the inclusion of double skin glazing into the standard and refers to the centre for window and cladding technology, or CWCT, as I'll keep referring to it, technical guidance notes 66, 67 and 92, which you will see banded about, sometimes appearing on quotes. Now, these technical notes basically cover both safety from falls through glazed roofs and roof elements and also their robustness. So there are basically four classes of roof as described in those CWCT notes. Now, class zero, um, that would be considered as a walk-on, and it's got to be designed um, as floors are basically outside the scope of CWCT, and any glazing with any kind of unrestricted access must be class zero or walk-on. I know a lot about this sort of stuff. You're always welcome to work out and reach and talk to me. Um, Lamilux don't do walk-on glass, um, and my little caveat on this is, is always be careful of specifying specifically a walk-on product on a commercial build of any kind building because it can't be a standard glass spec. It becomes a big white elephant. And to save everybody a boring explanation that I would find very interesting, if you're looking into something like that, reach out and ask. Um, class one, that's got to be designed having regard to the technical note 66 and tested to technical note 67. Um, the outer pane is robust due to, to walk on for occasional cleaning and maintenance and will therefore need to support both the weight of people and their equipment. This is a very sensible thing to ask for on, on somewhere where you know that there is going to be maintenance due on glass. So class one is a good one. Now, class two can be designed to technical note 66 and tested to 67 or more commonly you can use a simplified deemed to satisfy glazing for class two per technical note 92. Now this technical note 92 option basically offers a good alternative uh, with some standard glass specs based on previous tests and experience with the industry but it's limited in its size and, and types of laminated glass but it does mean if you ask for a class two you you commonly get very similar sizes and very similar glass specs from different manufacturers. Class three is fragile and frankly should be avoided. Um, you just talk about two pieces of toughened glass. Nothing's going to stop anything or anyone falling. And you shouldn't be putting that above anybody's house head in this day and age. It's basically best practice to consider all roof lights to be fragile unless they have been recently assessed as otherwise. And finally, please remember that whilst the roof may not need to be accessible initially, that that may well change if equipment requiring maintenance access is installed at a later date, uh, for example, aircon or photovoltaic panels. Now, uh, just a little bit more on, in terms of like polycarbonates and domes. Um, as mentioned, the thermoplastic roof lights, they do fall outside of the CWCT. And whilst they should be tested to confirm them, conform to non-fragile classification under the ACR, this type of material may deteriorate over time and therefore so, so product fall through protection can therefore be provided or enhanced using any of these sort of accessories that are available. Um, spot welded fall through protection, safety nets or even openable fall through protection if access is required and that sort of thing might be a good idea. So here is generally a section that I could quite happily chat to you about for the rest of the day, um, um, but trying to cut this down into a concise and useful piece of information. Um, sunlight can basically result in excess heat and glare due to the orientation of skylights. This is referred to as solar gain. Um, now this can lead to discomfort in some indoor environments, especially those with glass roofs or with large glazed areas resulting in increased mechanical cooling demands. The latest double and triple glaze solutions can provide solar control, which reflect and filter the sun's rays, allowing natural daylight into the room with reduced solar gain. Rooms can be kept cooler during sunny periods, reducing the need for air conditioning. Now, the top grey dotted line on this slide, this one here, that represents the performance of clear glass. And, uh, the line graduates upwards 
uh, with more light transmittance or the LT value, there's a fairly even increase in solar heat gain, and that's the G value. Now, the high performance solar control coatings are all grouped underneath this line. They're all down here. Now, generally, there's a linear relationship between the light and heat transmission that a glass can achieve. So a, a really desirable ratio of two to one, uh, i.e. that the light transmission is twice that of the heat transmission, was totally unachievable as little as 20 years ago. However, double and even triple silver coatings are now possible. And this is represented on the graph by the, the bottom straight dotted line here, this one down here. This is a recent innovations. Um, and this is as thinner and thinner atomic levels of metal coatings can be applied to the glass during coating. Um, this is a process called magnetron spluttering, which I just leave in the CPD because I think it sounds fun. Um, now, any, any coated glass bound to the right of this little curved line here, that's the sweet spot. Um, that's generally the way the most desirable um, glass configurations are, as it transmits excellent levels of daylight whilst also reducing some solar heat gain. Um, little FYI, um, you'll sometimes see these things on glazing quotes where you see these re references, and that basically means that, uh, that you get a 70% light transmission and a 0.37 G value. Um, furthermore, off the back of that, it's also worth mentioning these um, that glass manufacturers and coaters, they, they base those codes on a standard glazing spec of 6 mil, 40 mil spacer, 6 mil. And roof lights generally tend to use thicker glass than that, and that will all affect the light transmission and the solar G value. So just a tip, if it's an important thing, if light factors and stuff are important, once you, a glass spec is known, you can all, you know, you can very easily arrange for a full photometric data sheet to be supplied. You, you know, something you can just ask for if it's if that's something that needs to be monitored on a project. So obviously, increasingly, EPDs are used as a verification for sustainability certification systems uh, for buildings, example, um, like Breen. Um, they show a standardized environmental performance and products are a way of manufacturers to show transparency and demonstrate that they are looking to improve their process efficiency. They are based on life cycle assessment of a product and are third party verified. The availability of EPDs could result in credits as well. Um, EPDs are available across the range of our products at Lamulox. Now, this is difficult for me because I've worked as, for another roof light company for many years and who dismayed the importance of thermally broken. Um, but thermally broken is a term that relates to a frame of a roof light window or door and as is equally as important, if not more so than the glass specification. Now, metal has a very low thermal mass, meaning it conducts and loses heat very easily. In order to eliminate the potential of a low thermal performing product and prevent heat loss through the frame of a roof light, a thermal broken frame should always be specified. Now, a thermal break is a section of non thermally conductive material that is used within a roof light frame to separate the internal and external pieces of the frame into two thermally separate parts. And it's important when separating two different climates. So, for instance, the inside and outside temperatures, as it prevents the transfer uh, of temperature through the frame. Now, the separator material, which is used between the inner and outer frames, prevents the inside and outside of the frames getting cold, which consequently prevents condensation on the inside frame and ultimately mold. And now, all lamellax roof lights and glass roof products feature thermally broken aluminium frames which are also isothermally balanced, which we'll look at in the next slide, featuring optimally aligned 10 degree isothermal lines. And this means that the thermally broken line remains within the structure for a consistent heat insulation. So I mean, if we look at this and in comparison, um, and what you have here is a thermally broken system, a, a sort of traditional uh, T-section metal profile, which is very evident the sort of thing you find. Um, now, the purpose of a finite element analysis of a roof light frame in a glass, glass construction is to prove using building physics that the isothermal line which runs through the frame, representing the dew point, remains a smooth and unbroken line. The isothermal line is the red line shown on each of these above. So it's this one here goes here and this one here goes all the way down here. And the model shows the conditions for the temperature range between an external temperature of minus five degrees and an internal temperature of 20 degrees, and importantly, a relative humidity of 
Now the colors show areas of the product which are at the same temperature. And any break in the isothermal line means that the condensation will collect on the surface at this point. If condensation occurs, it will cause moisture problems which can damage insulation, internal linings, and the general building fabric and contents. And this, this is the kind of conditions that are ideal to, for some kind of, to create an unhealthy environment. Now we prepared a finite element analysis of the a frame, a frame cross section of our own product. And as I say, compared it with the classic silicone T stuck T bars frame of products, uh, modular roof lights, which is very, very typical. Um, and there is clearly a difference. And specifying a roof light product and curb interface without checking their isothermal properties could lead you to inadvertently incorporate conditions into the fabric of a building that literally help grow mold spores. One of the interesting things I think has come out as well recently with oh. well, um, people are increasingly now having to create thicker curbs on site because the sort of traditional a lot of companies used to work sort of 75 mil thick kit uh, timber curbs. And you just can't meet the required U values by doing stuff like that now. And, and when people are now creating thicker curbs, unfortunately, part of that is not only does it not look very good from above, but it's also extending this area. And by the nature of the weak point on these sort of products, you're actually just giving an even nicer surface for mould to build up and things like that. Um, and I'm always starting to see some of this. So uh, another element is air tightness. Uh, relevant regulations can be found in approved document L and are based on air permeability of the whole envelope. Now the measure is metre cubed per hour per metre squared. Now for new domestic dwellings, the current uh, approved document L limits are eight metres cubed per hour per metre per metre squared at 50 pascals or 1.3 metre cubed per hour per metre squared at four pascals. For non-domestic applications or new buildings, the worst acceptable limit is eight meter cubed per hour per meter squared at 50 pascals. This is all very complicated. I thought I've always found this quite complicated. Now, if you contrast this with the passive house certification, where the air tightness target is expressed differently as N50, and that's defined as the number of air changes per hour in a building at a reference prefer differ differential as 50 pascals. Now, since the result is calculated using the building's internal air volume, metre cubed, rather than using its envelope area or metre squared, the N50 units can be simplified as air change per hour or AC over H. So for passive house air tightness, the limit is 0 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. I just think that I, I just personally found that much easier to click with than the original way of doing things. Um, for improved energy efficiency and much better control of the indoor, envi indoor environment, better air tightness standards are required than the relatively relaxed worst acceptable limit set by the building regs. You should pay attention to elements such as windows and roof lights, which could potentially jeopardise your building's air tightness if the product interface is not robust or the results depend too much on the quality and experience of the installation team. Also note, and I found this amazing, that the regs allow for opening vents to be temporarily sealed up during site testing, which I, I never understood. So maybe consider specifying opening vents which are actually airtight tested and compliant when closed naturally. Now, due to the performance gap between the declared air tightness values and actual realised air tightness levels, uh, specifiers are recommended to follow the ATTAMA guidelines and over specify the air tightness. I mean, simply otherwise, if the products underperform, then so will the building. Now, just to put all of this into perspective, the class four mentioned at the beginning of this presentation with some of the products indicates that the windows or door system have been tested to pressures up to 600 pascals. So similarly relevant um, is water tightness or sloped glazing. The, the recommended minimum pitch is 15 degrees. So if designing any shallower, then insist on manufacturer's watertight test results. And, and put simply, in my opinion, if, if anything is less than 15 degrees, it's not windows, it's not curtain walling, it's a roof light. And it needs to be a manufacturer that can do that. And unfortunately, very few people transition between vertical, pitched and uh, horizontal. For domes, watertight tests 
Heating does not simulate extreme weather and do not take into account the effect of wind. Um, so again, consider specifying roof lights which are watertight tested against the driving rain to avoid some devastating consequences. Uh, the driving rain index or DRI test for roof lights involves testing wind, uh, testing in a wind tunnel at speeds of 70 miles an hour, which is a much more robust test. So just putting this into practice, um, so this example on the left of this slide, um, it just shows a flat roof light installation that was continuously leaking. Didn't matter how much the client tried to patch it up. Um, now the problem was that the system is just not designed to be watertight down to the shallow pitch of this design. Many systems do start to struggle with water tightness below 15 degrees, and many solutions are simply adapted curtain walling, which is just not designed for lower pitches. If you are designing it flat, then get proof of watertight tests for the proposed system at the pitch of your design. Um, today, we also have to work to BSEN 1090, uh, the stand for aluminium and steel structures, which made it an offence to supply fabricated structural steelwork or aluminium to site that does not conform to the standard and carry the CE mark. Um, so upstands and uh, supplied upstands and site built upstands. Um, upstands are often built on site. And as I say, courtesy of approved document L. Now, now have to meet a minimum U value of 0.35 watts per meter square Kelvin. However, um, some suppliers, um, such as us, um, do have a range of roof lights available with insulated GRP upstands. And then obviously, if it's part of the roof light, the overall performance of the roof light can be used. Um, it is kind of the perfect fit. Uh, you do get an improved thermal performance, weathering and air tightness, um, and even more so with circles, which, as I say, creating timber circle curbs is a nightmare for anyone, um, especially if you've got to then try and introduce a pitch into that. The, that, the GLP heat insulated upstand also has a, a seamless silk white interior finish, which removes the need for some internal plastering. And you can get them in a variety of heights. I mean, obviously, the building regs want 150 mil clearance, but what you typically see are 300 mil higher or higher upstands where they're put into warm roofs and the insulation is then simply built up around them, um, uh, which is it just they just have to turn up a lot earlier in builds rather than the traditional roof light. In terms of interfaces, it's quite simple, really. You just need to look at samples and, and understand the actual interfaces and make sure that there's that the interfaces aren't the weak points in designs. Um, examples above show some Lamilux products, including inner flashing insulation, frame interfaces, and external drainage, uh, drainage to the glazing capping strips, and little things like you can have capping strips that go over the top of them that make it like a nice little cap cover that look nice, but they're, they're not cheap. And if they're on the top of the building and no one can see them, why do it? But it, you know, details. So whilst roof lights can provide daylight, um, we can also provide some other functions, um, some daily vent ventilation as proved document F, some access, which has all got to be compliant with K, and smoke ventilation and shed functions, which needs to be compliant to approved document B and also uh, EN 12101-2. Now we'll just split these down a little bit. Daily ventilation supplies fresh air into buildings and is for comfort, cooling and the prevention of overheating. In addition, there are many proven cost savings and health and productivity benefits, as previously mentioned, especially where the concept of cross ventilation can be developed. There are many different products available to achieve this. Um, examples shown in this, uh, just examples of our, our, one of our modular roof lights with an electrical chain actuator, as well as that new MS78 system, which I, which I mentioned earlier. earlier. Now, the primary aim of Green UK new construction is to mitigate the life cycle impacts of new buildings on the environment. And the BRE's SD5078 Green New Construction 2008 document for new domestic buildings sets out clear guidance for the design of adequate ventilation of internal spaces as part of its assessment and certification scheme. Uh, you can get up to four credits uh, that are available for meeting the green requirements for natural ventilation within new buildings. Now, the construction products regulation was introduced in 2013. As a result, 
construction products have to include CE marking and be accompanied by declarations of performance or DOPs. Smoke ventilation is covered by approved document B and as mentioned EN 12101-2 um, and we're just going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, there are a couple of bits on this in terms of smoke vent ventilation that I find particularly important to stress. Um, and it really is important to consider the detail, um, particularly the declaration of performance. This document reports the findings of the various parts of the test within EN 12101 part two. And in practice, you can have a poorly performing product that just meets the statutory requirements and still carries that DOP. Um, there's a couple of areas to pull out. So Appendix B, uh, determination of aerodynamic free area. And I have a lot of time with architects and stuff who have trouble with this one. Now, there's a difference between geometric free area of an AOV compared with the aerodynamic free area. For example, uh, a one metre squared AOV does not result in one metre squared of smoke ventilation. It's actually closer to 0.7, and this is because it takes into consideration the mechanism and everything that's actually blocking the opening, as if, same as if you had a gauze over the top, it would reduce it. It's therefore critical to liaise with the fire engineer to determine the nature and amount of smoke ventilation required and check with your supplier to ensure that the necessary performance can be achieved. Compatible controls are also required, along with annual inspection and maintenance. It is the principal designer's responsibility to coordinate safety requirements with a qualified person, i.e. fire engineers. The specific relationship between the mass flow rate, the ventilated area, the inlet meat squared area and the smoke layer uh, can all be demonstrated by a complicated equation, which somebody else should do. Now, the regulation can all be found in the proof document B, as I say. Um, and I see every other job, one metre by one metre opening with a little note to achieve one metre squared clear opening. And then it says AOV. And I know that, that whoever's drawn that up didn't know. The second one is Appendix C, which is the test method for reliability and genuinely gobsmacked when I came about this one. So during testing, the unit is put through its paces on an opening and closing function. And there are different levels of smoke ventilation reliability ratings based on the number of opening and closing cycles tested. So if a unit has only been tested to RE50, which is 50 cycles, and you are carrying out a weekly fire alarm or an AOV test, then you will have reached the tested capacity for the product in less than a year. Also, if the unit is dual purpose and you were using it for ventilation, it should be tested to at least 10,000 cycles to uh, simulate regular opening and closing for comfort ventilation. And the RE rating should be shown in the product data. I was gobsmacked to, to, when I looked into this to see how many products on the market are, are, are things like RE50 that cost thousands of pounds. So it's definitely something I would recommend looking into. Um, incidentally, Mamelux vents are tested to 10,000 cycles. Now, when specifying a smoke vent, it's important to verify the declaration of performance and just scrutinise all the levels of the test criteria, not that it's just compliant. Can't stress that enough. It's also essential that any control panels have both primary and secondary power supplies, uh, main battery backup, capable of operating system in the event of a fire, and primary power failure. Sheds are usually controlled electrically with 72 hour battery backups. Final connections, testing and commissioning should be completed by the supplier or an improved competent professional. Um, it's interesting because on large schemes, you often now see tier one construction, construction companies procuring a quantity of roof light products, splitting all the roof lights into a roofing company but pushing the smoke vents onto an M&E company to be installed side by side because of the commissioning. OK, so access wise, you've got two main types of roof access. Um, you've got occasional ladder access and stair access. Both types allow the user to gain access to the roof. Um, both are designed for completely different type building types, purposes and users. Roof access hatches, such as the ones that Lamelux offer, can be multifunctional, offering the added benefit of giving some daylight transmission into a building and also serving for some daily ventilation purposes as well. 
um, by incorporating a roof light which functions as a roof access hatch. This not only saves space on a roof, but also removes the cost associated with having to supply separate elements to perform these functions. Um, flat roof commercial or industrial building projects such as schools, etc., all require occasional access to and from the roof for repair and maintenance purposes. And it's a legal requirement to organise and plan all roof works so that it is carried out safely. Roof access hatches offer a safe, economical, convenient and permanent way of accessing a flat roof. An advantage of a roof access hatch is that to actually climb, the actual climb onto the roof is usually only one storey. Um, and permanent ac external access systems such as cage ladders, they can have a negative impact on the look of a building and they are also potential access uh, by unauthorised persons. Um, easy. Now, the second type of roof access hatch is the regular stair access. In densely populated urban areas where private outdoor spaces are at a premium, rooftop terraces and patios are a popular design choice. Many residential buildings with rooftop gardens don't see much internal daylight and careful consideration is required to determine an access point to the roof terrace. For such rooftop projects where stair roof access is required, Lamilux offer three luxury roof access products designed to give generous daylight into conjunction with safe and convenient regular access to the roof terrace. And the focus is primarily on architectural standards and comfort. Now, I have done a lot of access projects um, over the years and experience really does dictate if this is a sort of thing that someone's involved in at any time. Um, you've got to work in collaboration with whoever's supplying that kind of product. It's not a, a structural opening size. It's got to, you know, you've got to consider the staircase is going to got to conform, what the final step is like, whether there's decking. Typically, if I see a project like that during design, it may well happen because also there's the cost associated and the logistical reality because these very often involve cranes. Um, but if I see something like this where oh, we're on site and we yeah something in the spec and we just need a, a two metre by two metre, that they, they don't happen and they end up being balustraded and complicated and nightmare for people. So it's just my advice is always if that's the thing, reach out and get early advice. So obviously there's a host of exciting materials to choose from when anyone's designing some atrium glazing and roof light solutions. The products available will be entirely dependent on the client's technical requirements, environmental factors, building regulations. You may or may not be aware of um, the build budget, the procurement, your creative approach, um, but do consult with manufacturers to take advantage of their knowledge and experience and use them as a free partner in the design and development team of your project. Many suppliers have their product specifications available on platforms such as MBS or Specified By to help architects and specifiers simplify the early stages of this specification process. By using a company with product listings on these platforms, not only are you saving yourself some valuable time, but you're also eliminating the risk of procuring some non-compliant solutions. You, as I say, you don't have to be an expert, you just have to have someone in your corner that can advise you. Do ask for some Ask manufacturers for some independent product test results, um, including verification of their CE labels, which are assumed to be UKCA, declaration of conformity. Um, also look for other quality indicators on the company like ISO 9001. Um, these and other standards often provide a very good indicator regarding the, the manufacturer or the supplier, their support, resources and, and product performance generally. Now, the best way to get verification on product performance claims is to model products which are on BIM um, with all their performance characteristics. Um, we recommend you consult with manufacturers to take advantage, um, but not all products are done or projects are done on BIM. Um, you can, we can supply PDF files, that's the way that we tend to work in the UK. Um, PDF files are available on the website, a wider selection if, uh, and DWG files are also available, but someone have to reach out to a technical manager. Um, always contact suppliers. Um, I think the most frustrating thing with, with specification is receiving a product, at, uh, a project at tender or something or that someone has specified a product in and then not being able to actually help because the product specified isn't suitable or isn't available in the requested size or configuration. Um, 
and and just you know just avoid the whole kind of cut and paste specification process that can appear and and then what results in what we call unicorn products that nobody can make so hopefully this would conclude our learning outcomes and these would be things that uh, we can now tick off your understanding of um, we do have a number of case studies that we always go through, but I, I really only ever just like to show the next slide, which is this is quite close to my heart. Um, this is actually complete before I joined Lummy Lux and I was aware of the school. It's actually less than half a mile from where I live and I actually went round and had a look at this as a prospective school for one of my children um, and didn't have any idea about the history of it or the fact of that it was uh, the Harris Academy, which was designed by Archetype. It was the first and largest passive house secondary school in the UK, um, and it's been and it's gone on to be recognised for building outstanding performance. And I think the thing was interesting, having none of this knowledge when I visited the place, I said to my other half, just in terms of the environment, I've never been in a school like it. It was bright, it was calm, um, the kids were moving about, but it, it was the most alive environment in the school of all the schools that I went to and my son actually chose to go somewhere else for academic reasons but it's just really interesting and something to be very proud to, to say to be part of um, we worked some there was uh, 10 glass roof lights uh, put on this project a couple of smoke lift uh, smoke uh, certified smoke lifts and lots of chef control panels and stuff like that it's something we did with Will Dixon um, and yeah, just something I'm very proud of. Um, and just one other, one last slide, which is uh, another school in Wimbledon, um, which is the King's College School. Uh, it's one of the most academically successful schools in the world. And we refurbished it with some uh, mono pitch L-shaped roof lights. Um, the music room of the school required a very high level degree of sound protection, a little specialism and there is that as well. Um, and in the end, uh, yeah, bespoke glazed roof, um, with a sort of 45 hip turn in it, which I thought was very cool. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and sorry for the problems at the beginning. Um, please do take note of my contact details. Feel free to reach out um, if you have anything you'd like to discuss. Lovely, thanks very much, Barry. Um, and there's a couple of questions in the chat. One here, uh, approved document O, how do you provide shading or compliance, especially in a domestic setting? Well, a lot of the products will have, let me, when my screen comes back, there we go. Um, a lot of the products are available with external shading. Um, opening, if you have, uh, typically the problems come in uh, multi-part systems with openers because the openers sit higher than the fixed and you can't have a blind that goes across the top of everything. Um, but that new product that I mentioned, because it all sits in plane, there is a blind solution coming out from that, which will be internal um, that could do it. But typically, if you are actually wanting to reduce heat, you need the shading to be external because there's no point putting shading up on the inside of a roof light because the heat has already come through. So external shading is usually the best preferred option with that. OK, thank you. And then another one here was, do you make a 30 minute fire resistant roof light for a flat roof? We do. But the problem is that roof needs to be made of concrete. Um, we are getting a lot of inquiries. It's a really good question. We're getting a lot of inquiries where roof lights have been put on projects. Building control have come along and said that needs to be fire rated. And then inquiries are put out into the marketplace for 30 or 60 minute fire rated roof lights, which I, I can sell. However, the idea that that is going to perform correctly when it's put onto a timber roof on a single story extension is ridiculous. Um, and it's become a little bit of a nonsensical thing in the industry at the moment where from Lamilux's perspective, because because that fire rated product is a designed product, we would want to see suitable detail before we would even quote for it. So we wouldn't be supplying a fire rated product to go onto a timber roof because it's pointless. It's supposed to sit on concrete. We see it a lot. Thank you. And then I've got one from Scott here. It's, it's just as water tightness for Shetland? Question mark. Because we Shetland say, has a lot more rain than anybody else. I, I would say, given that the vast majority of our passive house projects are based in Scotland, and that pretty much every passive house school in Scotland has been done with us, 
non issue. If anyone was going to be able to give you water tightness and air tightness, that looking at, by, by going to a passive house standard, but not for the benefits of passive house, if you're simply looking for something that is very well prepared against the elements, is a good way of looking at it. Lovely, thank you. That's it. I'm not sure there's any more questions ready. Let me just check the question section, the things sitting in there. So, um, thank you very much. All right, oh, hold on, one more here. Why is a 30 minute fire resistant? Oh, that's just disappeared. Where's that gone to? Why is it oh, ridiculous? Is it no, not ridiculous. No, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. Well, yeah, well, yeah, why, why is a 30 minute fire ridiculous? <laughs> Well, no, the roof light's not ridiculous. It's just the idea that it can go onto a timber roof and because you get a situation where the roof would burn and the roof light would still be sitting there. So why the roof light needs to be fire resistant when the roof that it's going onto wouldn't perform to the same is no one can answer me that. OK, Thank we, you put, we put like, we put 60 and 90 minutes on, on hospitals and things like that because of their distance to perimeters and things, but it's not a domestic product typically. Lovely, thank you very much. I think it's everything. I don't think there's anything else coming in. So thank you very much again, Barry, for your time and thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, the you. session has been recorded, so uh, I'll do a little bit of trimming tomorrow of the, <laughs> the pause in the middle when the technology decided to let us down. But uh, thank you very much, everybody, and have a good evening. Have a good evening. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.